All right, today we're going to talk about a classic problem, the classic problem in the iPhone 5, and that's iPhone 5 battery replacement pry damage. Pry damage happens when you do any repair in the iPhone 5 that involves you taking out the battery. Uh, maybe you're going to replace the home flex, or maybe you're going to replace the power flex, or you're going to, you know, fix anything in the phone, the screen even, and you decide that you need to take the battery out for some reason. So in the iPhone 5, the battery is adhered in the bottom of the phone with a really strong adhesive, and it's really tempting when you open up the phone to, to pry the battery out along the edge of the board right there, instead of along the edge of the frame. If you pry the battery out along the frame, you'll be fine, because you'll be putting pressure on the edge of the frame. If you pry the battery out, you know, right there in the middle along the edge of the board, then you're putting a lot of crushing downward pressure right there on the edge of the board, and that causes big problems for the iPhone 5. So the thing that you'll probably notice is that you'll have no power button, the top lock unlock power button, and no home function when you do um, pry damage. So let's look at this phone here. This is phone has come in for pry damage and it has no function of the power button. Now we know that you can, you can prompt a phone to boot um, by pushing the power button or by plugging in a charger. So in this phone, we're gonna plug in a charger to prompt it to boot. And it's showing us the Apple logo. And then this phone is showing us that it's in recovery mode. And I'm just going to take a little aside here. I come across another issue a lot. This is not DFU mode. And the, the internet describes this as DFU mode or device firmware upgrade mode. This ain't it. This is recovery mode. It is possible to put a phone into DFU mode, which um, leads to a, a dark screen, just backlight only, no image. Um, and that's two different sort of recovery um, modes that you can put the phone in, recovery mode or DFU mode. This, when you see the connect to iTunes uh, sign, that's recovery mode. So here we have the phone booting into recovery mode. And you might be prompted to think, well, I got to restore the phone. That's the only way around this. And that's not true. So one of the other things I say all the time is don't try to use software solutions for hardware problems. It's never going to work. Battery pry damage is a hardware problem. There's no amount of wishful, you know, restore via iTunes that's going to take this away. And I want to show you this, that um, the signal for the phone to enter recovery mode is if you were to take any phone, connect it to USB, and then if you were to prompt it to boot with a power button and push the home button down as it was booting. That's the signal to enter recovery mode. And you can do that whenever you have a device that you, know, you uh, need to force into recovery mode because you don't know the passcode or something like that and that you'd like to try to restore it. You can force recovery mode that way. In this phone, because of pry damage, um, the way the pry damage has happened, it's inappropriately activating the home button. So that means that just by me prompting it to boot with a charger, it thinks that the home button is pressed, and that's what's making it go into recovery mode. So if you have a phone like this, and you don't feel like repairing the um, pry damage, you don't have to. You can live just fine without it. The phone will work. You just won't be able to use the power button, and you won't be able to use the home button. You can substitute assistive touch. You can turn that on and have a substitute home button and, and have a, a perfectly fine phone for a long time. And maybe that's not a bad idea, since the iPhone 5 is kind of getting a little long in the tooth. So let me show you how this would work. If you have a phone that's acting like this because of pry damage, you can open it up, you can disconnect the battery, reconnect the battery, and now we're back in our same problem where we can't get this thing to turn on. So now I will insert the charge uh, cord to prompt it to boot. And this time when I see the Apple logo, I'm going to take out that charge port. That way, even though it thinks the home button is pressed right now, because it's not attached to, the, uh, to a USB port, it's not going to trigger that recovery mode. And so, you know, at least my guess here, <laughs> I could be wrong, is that this phone is going to um, boot as normal. Probably the person sending it did like try to restore the phone and so this phone will probably like you know complete uh, an iTunes restore uh, now. Yep and it looks like that's what it's doing and then it will boot to uh, like the activation wizard. So this is just sort of a, a tip 
if you have recently done battery pry damage and your phone is booting to recovery mode, you can prompt it to boot with a charger, pull out the charger at the Apple logo, and then your phone will return to normal just as it was with all your data and intact as long as you didn't try to restore it. All right, so let's see if this phone will come up and if it, and, and then we'll, yep, so here it is. So now we can use this phone. We can set it up, click through the, click through the menu and we would be able to use this phone as normal. However, it's here because it's uh, here for battery pry damage um, uh, repair. So I'm going to show you how to do that. This is a, a very typical repair. So let's take a look under the microscope at what battery pry damage looks like. I'm going to take the battery out of this phone. And I'm going to lift up the two interconnect cables being really careful not to damage an adjacent chip. And now let's look at the uh, microscope mode here. All right, and so let's take a look. First thing I want to call your attention to is this chip here, this one that's marked U16X, this chip. And it's not all iPhone 5s have that marking on it, but uh, this chip is a baseband power IC. And this is commonly damaged by screwdriver slips at this screw here. So if you've got a technician that lets a screwdriver fly over here and you get any kind of mark or nick on that chip, then your phone is going to have a searching no signal problem after you do the repair. So it's probably may not be worth it to, to even start that repair. Um, so look for that first. This one looks okay, so we will move on to say this is a candidate for repair. So now here we are looking as a survey of the damage along the edge of the board. This is classic pry damage. And I like to stock all of these tiny little components back here, and we offer our pry damage service as a flat rate sort of all or nothing. So no matter what is wrong back here, um, I have uh, stock of every single one of these little capacitors, filters, resistors, and IC components that we can just sort of pop back in. All right, so there's one big concern here when we look at this chip here. This chip is DZ101 underscore RF. And so what does that chip do? The internet will tell you, because, you know, phones are pretty common and lots of forums talk about phones and pry damage is pretty common. You can read about it in a lot of places. And the internet will tell you, oh, the DZ101 is required. You need to be able to put that back. And if you can't put that back, you're going to be screwed because the internet believes that this is actually required for, um, for SIM card detection. And that's not true. This component here is actually part of an ESD protection for the SIM card circuit. So ESD protection, electrostatic discharge protection, this IC chip, when functional and in place, is part of a protection loop. So if the phone uh, detected some, uh, you know, you know, static event like you're out, you know, walk, you're, you're walking in carpet, shocking your kids in the winter, um, then uh, then this chip is part of a circuit that will shut off the SIM card line in response to electrostatic discharge. Uh, and that's a pretty rare thing, so you can actually get by just fine. You'll never even notice if you don't have that ESD protection for the SIM card line function intact. Um, so, so DZ101, when it has pads missing, like in this case, so here are we looking at this chip right here, and when you see this sort of red mark on the chip, that's the actual pad, and that pad has been severed from the board. So we can see, uh, we'll throw that away, and we can see that there's a trace leading to the missing pad here. Hairy tweezers. I hate hairy tweezers. Uh, and then another trace leading to a pad over there that's missing. So there should be five pads here. This one is missing too. So the right repair for this spot on the board 
is to omit DZ101 underscore RF. If we had both pads, it would be straightforward to put it back, and that would be the right pair. But there's no real you know, uh, motivation to rebuild pads to place that chip, especially because if the chip is placed wrong or it fails or one of the pads is not you know, making contact, then it will inappropriately activate that ESD shutdown of the SIM card line. And I've seen that two or three times where uh, uh, you know, the, the phone looks like it has a normal looking DZ101 underscore RF after pry damage, so you just sort of leave it alone, and then the phone will come back to me because it has a no SIM detection problem. That is separate from the searching no signal problem from the, uh, the U16X chip underneath. Uh, this DZ101 underscore RF problem you can avoid if you just take that chip off and don't ever look back. All right, so we're going to leave that alone, um, and then we're going to move to to this next chip here. So this chip is super important. This chip is U3, and U3 is a little buffer IC that routes both the power button and the home button. So this guy has got to be there. If that guy U3 is not there, you're never going to have power button and home button functions. And in addition, part of that circuit for power and home button function, um, the, these resistors R20 and R22 also need to be present. They are both required. So a lot of times you can say, I don't think I have pry damage because I only have you know, a defect in either power button or home button. That can happen when the, the U3 chip itself is just sort of nudged off of these front pads but are still intact in the back pad, so you can get signaling through the back part of the chip but not the front, or when you're missing one or the other of these small resistors, and that's the function of your pry damage. All right, so what we're going to do here, this is a little bit concerning because, man, this is, you know, look at DZ101, missing pads. Wow, this this phone is really close to having missing pads at U3 as well, and that would be a problem. If we have missing pads at U3, then if you want the power and home button function to work, you're going to have to repair those pads, and that's going to mean making micro jumpers that are super tiny, really difficult to place. You'd have to make a micro jumper to attach, uh, to, to bring the line here from, uh, from, I forget if this is R20 or R20. I had a poster over there, but that's too far for old eyes to see. Uh, then you need to uh, bring that uh, r restore from this uh, end of the resistor to the chip itself if this pad is missing. And it's possible these pads may come up, they're off, but still present. So we're just going to add a little bit of flux, and I'm going to take my hot tweezers, and I'm going to see if I can just kind of get them, get them to behave for me nicely. And I'm going to try to get them to just sort of lay back down. All right, so I just picked up the uh, little piece of the chip that was stuck to the pad. And now I'm going to just sort of smooth that back out. And then let's see if I can get these guys to behave. Okay, so that's good. So now those, I'm happy with how that looks. I don't want to mess with it too much. I'm not going to take braid and try to replace the lead-free solder on here. I'm, I think the right repair, the practical right repair to get a home button and a power button working in this iPhone 5 is to place a chip right on top of those pads, make it have an electrically sound connection, and don't do anything that's going to risk having those pads come off um, because that's going to be a tough repair and that and that repair a pad repair is going to be less robust than just living with the intact pad so i'm going to i'm going to give up on you know the the ideal situation of having a you know no mixing of lead free and leaded uh, solder uh, I will tolerate that alloy in order to be able to get a good result with the least amount of risk so that's that's what i'm going to do there and then Let's kind of continue looking up the board. So a lot of times in pry damage, you'll find that these tiny little local capacitors and resistors, even if they look fine, sometimes they're nudged slightly up off their pads, and sometimes the end cap of the, you know, the component will be off of the component. And when that happens, they should be replaced, and it's fa fairly straightforward to replace these. Now let's take a look at this component here. This is Q3.
And Q3, let's look at it. It has definitely been uh, insulted here. It is not, uh, it doesn't look uh, nor flush like normal. It has moved up a little bit. All right, and so this one I think is going to be okay for us to just sort of use a little bit of hot air and maybe pull it back down where it's supposed to go natively. Um, but I don't think we're going to need to actually replace that Q3. We could, but I don't think we, we need to do that. So I'm going to add a little bit of flux there as well. Okay. Now, since I'm going to be, I'm going to need to use hot air in order to deal with Q3, so I might as well place my U3 chip and see if I can seat that with hot air as well. In my experience, an iron works a lot better than hot air for placing U3, so I will probably go over that with my hot tweezers and see if we can get that to be good to go. All right. All right, so here's my U3 chip. Let's see if I can kind of get a bigger view here. And this chip does have, uh, you know, directionality that you need to pay attention to. And you can look up on the schematic how that goes, which everybody should uh, know how to do if you're going to do this kind of repair. I think what I'm going to do is actually seat this with the iron, just because I'm a little bit worried about those pads. So I'm taking a, let me see if I can get focus in my eyepieces as well as the, all right, that's not bad. All right, I'm going to add a little bit of solder to my uh, tips. No. All right, that's U3. And I could see that it flowed nicely and made some, uh, made some good joints there. So I'm happy with that. I would expect that to work. Um, while we're here, we're going to do some hot air on Q3. And one thing I learned the hard way, you got to take the SIM card out. If you leave the SIM card in here, um, then it will uh, easily get melted and be a real uh, problem when it's time to hand it back to the customer and they have a new sim to put in there and the one that the one that was in here is is all fried up so news flash take that out all right I'm gonna just put a little bit of hot air I'm gonna try to keep my hot air over here to the side let me see if I can give you a little bit more that's actually I'm fairly down I'm down fairly close to the to the bottom of the of the frame here because I want to avoid melting the back of that SIM card tray. It might melt a little bit. All right, now I'm going to zoom in so that we can we can both really watch. You know, you can see there's a little bit of a, uh, a solder uh, little tuft on the ends of these two compu components that are adjacent to Q3. So here and here. I'm just going to watch that, and when that sort of flows back to uh, normal, that'll tell me. That's sort of like a, a a tell that will tell me that the uh, that the joint is hot here. It looks pretty hot right now under there. Oof! There we go. All right, good enough. Well, that's pretty out of focus for you guys. All right, let me just clean that up a little bit with an iron. Oops. Okay. 
Okay. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. So to me, that looks pretty good. And so it's time to uh, clean off the flux with some uh, whatever you want to use, flux remover pen or alcohol. This is an alcohol and a Q-tip. And I've tested it, uh, all of these components, uh, made sure that they are, don't have any movement. Nobody has any broken end caps. The right repair was to leave off uh, DZ101. Uh, U3 is there, Q3 is there. All the small components look good. You should know from your schematic that um, something that looks like that is normal. Right here we see what looks like a missing component. But you can see that the, the solder from the factory on that component is rounded and that that is just sort of a sign that it was um, like that to begin with. So that would be a no stuff uh, part of the board where there, there might have been an, an option or an original design concept when the board was being printed um, to have a component there that was then sort of edited off or maybe it's there for a future iteration but ultimately it was not part of the final design and so it's not meant to be there. And you'll see that on the schematic represented by, uh, by the word no stuff. Okay. So now let's go ahead and go to testing mode. So I'm going to put down my uh, my interconnect cables here. And then I always like to just sort of skip skip out on the temptation to have this problem start again. So I take off this guy. I can't stand this guy. The little battery pull tab, the little you know tab here that that sits right on the edge of the board. Like pry here. It's a great idea. Right here. Right by you three. No. Mm -mm, just rip it off. That's a bad idea. Don't tempt somebody else down the run, down the line. I'm just gonna add a little piece of. Uh, double-sided adhesive red tape that everybody loves. You guys can figure out where to source red tape if you want. And then I'm going to put the battery back in. And press it down. Alright, now I'm going to test it before I screw everything back together. Alright, so now let's hope for a miracle and press this top power button. And I see Apple logo, yay! So we're gonna let this come, come up, and then think about how could we test the how could we test the home flex? You know, I could pop this screen down in here. In order for the home flex to work, these two gold contacts have to make contact here with the uh, two gold prongs that are part of the the you know dock connector in order to signal. Uh, the, the home button being pressed. Um, or we could just use a tool to short those together. So any kind of metal tool to touch both of those at once. And then when you're in activation, in the activation wizard, the function of pressing the home button is this little message, emergency call start over cancel. So when you see that, you know that home button works. So we'll take that away and then short together these two gold prongs and it comes back so that tells us that home button is working power button is working we can do off and on and with it off i can go ahead and fill in my screws here's another little sort of sign of a professional a lot of times these screws don't really matter, you know, which one is which. And uh, you just, as a professional, have to know when it does matter. But here in the iPhone 5, 
there's one screw here that um, has a characteristic shape. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Let's give it a try. This guy. See how it has this sort of like, uh, you know, a, a, a V-shaped uh, head? That guy goes in the, um, the middle of our battery shield brackets. And that one makes it fit really nicely in there and keep these guys down. So we'll fill in our other two screws. So I was, I had wished I had my camcorder or something to make a video earlier today. I went to, uh, I went, I went to uh, school. I was a uh, volunteering in class today and I was participating in a quiz of second graders on the weather weather system and the water cycle and different different forms of clouds, different forms of precipitation. And I made 12 second graders cry. And that was pretty funny. I wish I had a video of that. It was hilarious. I was trying to spice it up and they had a difficulty knowing what uh, the word humidity meant. And so we had a question on humidity and told them about it. And then I knew they would forget. And so I said, all right, at the end, I'm going to come back to this question and ask it again. And so we did. We got to the end. And I said, all right, here's the, here's the last question. And it's going to be worth 5 million points. 5 million points. Uh, how are you going to even write 5 million points on the whiteboard? I'm going to cancel my lunch and the rest of the afternoon to sit here and write those 5 million points up there to see who wins. Are you ready for the question? Yell it out when you know the answer. What is the relative term for when the atmosphere has a lot of water vapor in it? It's heavy with water vapor. It feels very muggy. That term is... And then one kid said, humidity. Good job, buddy. You win. And the other entire half of the class burst into tears, and uh, and I and I realized I had no business uh, dealing with second graders. All right, so here we are. It's all back together, and our home button is working fine, and our power button is working fine, and we can do the long press and power off. And that's how you do pry damage repair. Very common, very easy to avoid. Um, if you, if you, you know, are having, having this happen to you and you don't have your soldering station set up and you're not ready to source all these components into it, then you can find me at uh, Menden iPad Rehab on the internet and send it in for our signature pry damage service. And we do that every day. And that's the end of this one. <laughs>